Why don't you grab a Bible? You find a Bible in the seat in front of you if you're down here. <clears throat> Pardon me. Or if you're underneath, it'll be underneath your seat. You won't be underneath. You have the Bible be underneath your seat if you're up in our stadium seating. And I should probably tell you at the end, do not touch me or hug me because I am a germ factory. And I probably gave it to half the 9 o'clock service. So I should probably just tell you that right now because if you come up and hug, I will hug you. And I'll forget. So I'm just telling you right now. My doctor just cringes when, whenever I go to see him when I'm sick. He just says, you need to keep something in your pocket to wash your hands every time. He goes, Jackson, I'm concerned how much of the city of Chicago you are getting sick. I want to thank you for your prayers. You probably saw them off crutches, man. Now I'm on a cane. You know, I am beginning to move. So thank you for your prayers, for your emails, for your texts, for the meals. I, I am a very private person. And for to have this many people in my mess, I'm telling you, it was very uncomfortable. But I want to thank you that you would not let me walk through this alone. And now since I'm on a cane, I can drive. My poor wife had to drive me. She was at my beck and call for many, many weeks. I had to tie my shoes. And every time I dropped some, the Donna had to reach down and get it. And so now I just thank you, Donna, for the way you loved me and cared for me during that season. Perspectives class is coming up. Perspectives is one of the best things that you can do. I'm telling you, I took it in grad school. It was life-changing for me. Let's put a slide up here to give you this information. Perspectives is coming up. It is a class we do here. And if I could, if I could force every follower of Christ to take one class, this would be the one. If you want to be challenged, if you want to be pushed this year in the way you think about the world and how God's created the world and the issues of our world and what God is doing amongst us around the world, this is the class. I have sat through it many other times just to get refreshed in it. I now am one of the teachers of it. I've taught several places because I am committed to this class in the truths of this class. So I just want to encourage you. You can audit it. You can take it for undergrad. You can take it for grad level. You can just come and sit through the lectures. The first two weeks are free. So just come for the first two weeks and check it out and to see if it might be a good fit for you. And there's the information up on the screen. At the end of the service, we're going to take texting. I have no doubt that maybe some of the things that Nate just said or what I'm going to teach on is going to stir some questions that Steve started for us last week around tests and trials. And so if you'd like to ask those questions or maybe even a question that's come up in your small group and you're thinking, man, I wish Jackson was here. It's the time to ask those questions. We'll do it at the very, very end of our service. And the way you ask questions around here is in the text app, you put 62953 in the uh, phone number 62953 then in the body of the text it's really important that you put ask in in for near north ask in in otherwise it'll go some to uh, some other church sure it's a great question but we won't get it but ask in in and you'll know it works because we'll send a text back to you letting you know that we got it we're going to look at trials today and this particular passage means a great deal to me I've wrestled with this passage. A year and a half ago was the end of a year and a half trial that I went through, that Donna went through. A good friend of mine went through it. Somebody took a shot at me. Someone began to question my integrity. Someone began to call other people and tried to build a case against me. It was incredibly hurtful and hard. Incredibly hurtful and hard. And it went on for 18 months. And every time I thought, okay, it's just about to come to an end. It's just about to be over. We're going to get this thing settled. Then something else would happen and would start up all over again. And I tell you, what doubly hurt is when it included my wife and included a good friend of mine. And finally, in the midst of it, somewhere in the midst of it, the Spirit of God brought back to mind, James, look at James. I speak to this, God is saying, I speak to this in James. And this passage began to speak to me and began to remind me how I need to respond. So maybe this is true for you as well. Maybe this is a time that you are in the midst of a trial. And hopefully this passage will speak to you as God has used it to speak to me. Let's pray. Father God, we invite you in this space. We know you're everywhere all the time because you are an omniscient, sovereign God. But Father, what we would pray is that you would speak to us and that we would hear you, the whisper in our ear, the nudge in our heart. Father, I would pray that if I would say anything that is not of you, it would quickly be forgotten. But Father, 
When I say words, your words after you, that's where we know there is hope and conviction and encouragement because Isaiah 55 reminds us that when your words go out, they never return without you accomplishing your agenda in the hearts of people. We're going to trust that again right here in this moment. And then as we're going to look at in James in just a little bit, Father, where it says, may we not be merely hearers of your word, nodding our head, taking a note, feeling your conviction, feeling your encouragement, then walking out of here and forgetting. May we move from just hearers to doers, putting into practice those things that you are nudging us about. We thank you ahead of time for meeting with us in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn with me to James. James verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 9. It's going to be on page 1011. Okay, here we go. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass. Its flower, its flower falls and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, well, I'm being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one, but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Now, we're in this series called Real Religion. Remember what James is saying. James is going, yeah, we have a belief system as followers of Christ. There are certain things we believe, but the issue is not that we believe them. The issue is that we live these things out. What separates authentic followers of Christ is that it affects the way we think. It affects our behavior. In particular, in this context, what we're looking at this morning is how they were responding to persecution, how they were responding to suffering. That was the trial in particular that they're speaking about here. Now, as a pastor of the many years of sitting with people, I've had more conversations around testing and trials and temptation than probably any other particular subject. And because it is so important for us, what I want to do this morning is I want to answer a series of questions that I've heard over the years, and we're going to use this text to answer those questions. And I hope to make this as practical as I can for you. All right, here's the first question. What is a trial? What is a trial? Again, in the book of James, the trial they're experiencing is the suffering and the persecution of being followers of Yeshua, of Jesus, as being uh, uh, Jewish Christians, Jewish followers. But it's not only to Jewish followers, but to any Christian. But a trial can be spread out. It can be understood in a broader context. For some, it's a physical illness. For some, it might be a financial issue, the death of a loved one. It's not being married. It's not having children. It's the behavior of a particular child. You can just name any kind of things that can also be a trial for us. Let me see if I can define it for you this way. A trial is a difficult situation a season that stretches us and may push us to wrestle with our faith, asking, where is God in the midst of what we're experiencing? Some trials are big, like the one that I experienced 18 months ago, and some trials are smaller, like the one I just experienced for the last several months. Let me remind you of this. You're either in a trial, you're going to be in a trial, or you just came out of a trial. You're either in a trial, you're going to be in a trial, or you just come out of trial. Because trials are a part of life. They're a part of life. All right, second question. What's the difference between a trial and a test? What's the difference between a trial and a test? Now, let me show you where I'm getting this from. Look with me at verse 12. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. Now, all through Scripture, we can read where God tests. He tested Abraham. He tested the children of Israel. He tested Hezekiah, the king. He tests. Test is something God initiates. A trial is what we experience. It's what it feels like for us. A test is something God initiates, allows. A trial is what it feels like on our end. 
All right, next question. Why do we experience trials? Why do we experience trials? Now, let me just give you a context. God created humanity to have a relationship with humanity to, so that he might provide for them and have a love relationship with them. And as soon as humanity is created, humanity did the very thing that every one of us does. Humanity says in Adam and Eve, no, thank you. I think we got this. I don't fully need you. I'll call you if I need something. What has entered into the world at that point is sin and rebellion. There is a brokenness in our relationship with God. And because of the brokenness in our relationship with God, and because we become these broken, spiritually broken people, we begin to react to each other. We begin to hurt each other. Part of trials is what we do to each other because of our brokenness. Part of trials is what we do to ourselves because of brokenness. Part of trials is that we live in a broken world. We're told in the book of Romans, because of the rebellion of humanity, the world is also experiencing a decay because of it. Cancer and other illnesses, the issue I had with my hip, falls under this brokenness. But, but... What God does is he steps in and he redeems and he rescues us as a people and he draws us into a relationship, but he doesn't remove us from this broken world. Not yet. What he says is, is I'm going to be with you in the midst of the brokenness. I'm going to be with you. I am going to be your comfort. I am going to be your power and your guide. So that when we experience the brokenness of others, God says, I'm with you in that. When we run up into the brokenness of our own life, God says, I am with you in that. And I'm going to use it to grow you. I am going to use it to deepen your faith. Why do we experience trials? Just to remind you. It's not for God's sake. It's for our sake. We experience trials because trials are a test for us to indicate the depth of our own faith. What does our faith look like? Now, it's important that you hear this because it's important for me to remind myself of this. God is never malicious in delighting in the pain and suffering of his children. God does not test us for his entertainment. Because frankly, who could love a God who would do that? God allows trials so that we might show ourselves faithful. Look back at verse 4 in this passage. Steve shared this last week. He did a great job in reminding us what's the goal? Perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Spiritual maturity to be Christ-like. God does not test us to see us fail. God's greatest desire is that we would faithfully succeed in the midst of these trials, in the midst of these tests. We are tested so that we might grow. Let me remind you what Paul says to the church in Philippi in northern Greece in in the book of Philippians, chapter 1, verse 6. We'll put it up here on the screen. And I'm sure of this, that he, God, who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. God is at work. God is bringing about sanctification. Now, what does that mean? Spiritual transformation, being transformed into the character and likeness of Christ, to think like him and to act like him. Let's listen to ESPN. A coach was talking about self-scouting. He says, we spend so much time scouting the opponent, we forget sometimes to scout ourselves. He was talking about, we have tendencies we're not even mindful of. How much do we pass or run on first down? On third down and short yardage, do we run to a particular side? And so he says, we need to be mindful of our own tendencies. We need to make corrections and the things that we need to improve on. Just like we are scouting a a team that we're going to play, we need to scout ourselves. Trials is self-scouting. Trials show us where we are strong in our faith and where we are weak in our faith. Do I tend to blame others when I'm in the midst of a trial? Do I tend to seek wisdom from anyone but God in the midst of a trial? Do I complain a lot in the midst of a trial? 
One of our staff this week here at Near North during our Near North staff meeting was sharing her story, powerful story. And toward the end of it, she said this, when your life hits rock bottom, you find out where your faith is. In the midst of a trial, it reveals to us the level and the depth of our faith. One of the reasons that God became flesh and dwelt among us in the person of Jesus Christ is so that we might see how trials are to be handled as he dealt with all kinds of trials. God is a loving father who is committed to our spiritual maturity. A loving parent who cares about what happens to us and that we would grow. Loving parents are concerned for their children and will do the hard thing for the sake of the growth of their child. Let me share a story with you. This is our grandson, our first grandson when he was a baby. This is Bauer. I know. Is he not cute? I know. He looks like his grandfather. I know. (laughs) There's a thing that us parents know. It's called tummy time. You put your child on his stomach and they practice pushing up and lifting their head up. And when Bauer started doing this, he complained. He cried out. And my son, our son, Donna's son too, by the way. Donna's son, our son. (laughs) Donna just said, I think I did the hard work. Yes, you did. Yes, you did. He could not stand it. So he'd reach down and he'd pick Bauer up. And we had to put our arm around Josh. And we had to say, no, no, son, this is good for him. It's hard. It's difficult. But it's important for him to be able to develop the neck muscles. You don't want him to become 15 years old and walking around like this because he has no neck muscles. It's hard, but it's important. As parents, we do the hard thing in our kids' lives because we love them and we want them to grow There are tests involved, even in parents and our children. We test them. Do you remember getting your license? Do you remember you have that card and all you're thinking is, freedom! Well, I'm telling you as a parent, you know what we hear? Fear. Man, it freaks us out as parents putting you in a car. Remember when our kids started driving? You know, we taught them how to drive and they went around with them and I was there, Donna was there to be able to go, stop! Be careful. You're merging in. Be mindful. They get their license and they go, all right, I want to go. So we give them a short little test. We send them to the store. All right, go to the store and I need you to pick up these four things and come right home. Do not pick up any friends and stay off your phone. The whole time they're gone, man, you're going, okay, they're going to make it. Okay, they come. And then they walk in the door and you act like, oh, yeah, no problem. And then you give them something more to do. Another thing, maybe two or three stops the next time they drive. Because what you're doing is you're preparing them. You're getting them ready to drive without you. I mean, as a parent, we're doing that financially in all kinds of ways. We are testing them. We are growing them. Not because we don't love them, but because we love them so much. God, our Heavenly Father, is committed to us in the same way. He tests us for our sake so that we might know the weaknesses of our faith, but also the strength of our faith. Now, let's just be honest here for a moment. I've sat in my office with folks over the years that when they experienced the test and it was hard and they suffered and there was pain involved, they would say to me, How could God allow this to happen? How could God allow me to suffer and to struggle and to experience pain? And frankly, this is where some people lose their faith. It is right here because what they think they signed on for is they signed on for protection from anything difficult and hard. I should have no pain. I should have no suffering. I should have no difficulty. Because they don't understand what is the intent of a loving father in the life of his child. God allows these tests so that we're constantly reminded that he is perfecting us into the image of a son. And you know what we remind ourselves of? These are temporary. These are temporary because the day is coming. The day is coming when the best is yet to come. We remind ourselves we didn't suffer alone, that Jesus comes and he suffers 
that sin was so evil, so powerful, so ugly, that God could not sit around and do nothing. And he addressed our sinfulness. He addressed our rebellion by himself becoming flesh and living among us and dying a death on our behalf. In order that we would know suffering is temporary because the best is yet to come. That when we die, when we step into our eternity, there is no more suffering, there is no more pain, there is no more struggling. That Jesus has made a way, as we sang just a little while ago. Our faith is perfected. And we live in harmony with God through the presence of suffering and pain and struggle. Go back with me again and look at verse 3. Why does God allow trials? For you know that the test in your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete and lacking in nothing. Let's move on. Next question. How should we respond to a trial? Well, Steve said it really well last week. He reminded us we find joy in our trial, not happiness. Happiness is based on the, the emotions of the moment. Joy is a contentment in God and regardless of our circumstances. A steadfastness. Remember, he talked about it's developing strength, a muscle for us to be able to engage more and more in our lives. We seek wisdom. We go to God and we say, all right, God, I need help in understanding what is happening here and how do I respond? Now, that's how we should respond. But sometimes we don't respond that way. Look with me at verse 13. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. Instead of seeing trials as agents of grace in our lives that God will use to transform us into the character of Christ, if we cooperate, we seek relief. And instead of engaging with God, we seek to blame God. It's exactly what James is saying here, is that we seek to blame. The ultimate one we blame is God. It's not fair. How could I possibly respond in the right way? God's the one that's tempted me. It's God's fault. This is unfair for me. How could I ever handle this if God is behind this? If God loved me, this would never have happened to me. God doesn't care about me. Forget him. God can't be trusted God should be able to control this. God has made me do this. You think we're the first ones that ever blame God? You go back to the first man and woman of humanity that God created, Adam and Eve. You remember God places them in the garden, this perfect place. He gives them everything. He says, trust me, look to me. I want to provide for you. I want to be in a relationship with you as he meets them twice a day, person to person. And yet what happens? They rebel. They do the very thing that God has warned them about and said, man, don't do this. It's not going to be good for you. They do that very thing. And so God comes to have a conversation with them. And he says to Adam, what have you done? Let me show you his response here in Genesis 3. The man said, the woman who you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate. Do you see the subtleness of it? God our woman's fault and you know where the woman came from you created her so really this is your fault this is your fault god instead of adam owning his own thing he quickly blames god look what you've done god in the beginning of this trial that as i was experiencing i did ask god why are you doing this Why are you doing it now? Why are you doing it this way? God, you can make this stop, man. You can make this stop. And in the subtleness of my questions, what am I really saying? God, this is your fault. This is your fault. What James says here and what he says to me and what he's saying to some of us here, he's saying to us, Don't say this. This is not right. It's a rebuke that he has to us. It's if I say to my boys when they were growing up in our home and they did something they shouldn't do. Yo, dudes, what are you thinking? 
This would be contrary to the very nature of God to blame God, to say that He has caused us to sin, for God is not sin. He has nothing to do with sin. God may test us to show us the depth or the shallowness of our faith, but God does never, God never tempts us to sin. God, bottom line, will never tempt you to sin, to rebel, to live in contrast to the life that God has called you to. Why? Why would God ask you to sin when sin cost him so deeply with the death of his son? Why would he call you to something that cost him so greatly? God hates sin. Hates it so much that he has chosen to come in the person of a man to die for sin. Instead, James helps us understand who we should blame. Look with me at verse 14. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. It's not God's fault. God didn't tempt us. The temptation, the blame, goes right here. I'm to blame. You're to blame. No one causes me to act in a certain way. I cause myself to act in a certain way. Let each person, each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Lured and enticed, interesting words in the Greek, which the New Testament was written in. They're hunting and fishing metaphors. Lure is to set a trap for an animal. You put down some bait and you're going to lure this animal into this trap. Entice is a fishing metaphor. You, you bait a hook and you throw it in and the fish can't see the hook. It sees the bait and then, boom, you jerk it and now you've set the hook in the fish's mouth. They both are meaning the same thing. It's that there are things in us that tempt us. What drives it? Look at that word desire. The desire that says, I want, I need, I must have. Jeremiah says this about our heart in Jeremiah 17, 9, and we'll put it up here. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Our hearts spin these things out. My own desires spin these things out. Our desires left unchecked and uncontrolled by the Spirit continues to show up to lure me and deceive me and to entice me. You know what I do? I lie to myself. You lie to yourself. We convince ourselves that we have a right to feel a certain way, to believe a certain thing, to react a certain way. What's interesting is every trial has a temptation. Every trial that we experience, there is a temptation. The question is, will we embrace the trial and live faithfully, or will we succumb to the enticing of the desires in our life? What does it mean to resist? The quicker I am to process what I'm going through, the quicker I am to understand how my desires are spinning up in a bad way. The quicker that I am able to understand that this is a temptation, it's a test that I'm going through, that I am able then to understand how I'm likely to respond in a bad way. Let me give you a couple examples. Look with me at verse 9. He gives two examples. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation. Let the rich in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass. It flower falls and the beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuit. The first one he speaks to is the poor among us. The poor, those who have lost stuff in the midst of their suffering, in the midst of the persecution. It's the trial of poverty. And the trial of poverty produces the temptation of saying, I don't know if God loves me and cares for me. And what does James say? James says, no, you're exalted. Being poor can be a trial, but remind yourself that you have been exalted 2 Corinthians 8, 9 says it well for us as we think about this. For you know that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake became poor, so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. He says to them, yes, you're poor physically, but you are incredibly wealthy spiritually. 
And frankly, the poor within us are to be cared for by us. That's our responsibility. But look at verse 10. The rich are to boast in their humiliation. It's the trial of prosperity. And you know what the temptation is? I don't need God. That many times the wealthy say, I don't need God. I don't have any need that I cannot provide for myself. We have lost sight of what is true of our soul. We have been deceived into thinking that we ourselves are God. And he reminds them that their wealth is going to fade away like the grass. It will be scorched and be gone. You cannot take it with you. And he says for them, you should delight in your humiliation, meaning you should delight in the suffering of Christ. You're connected in Christ. For some who are wealthy, they see their wealth as a blessing to be used for others. And yet for some, they see it a blessing for themselves. How about the trial of singleness? The trial of singleness. I want to be married. I don't want to be alone. I'm afraid that I'm getting too old. When's it ever going to happen? And you know where the temptation is? We settle for less than what God has designed for us. The first one who will show us interest. The first one who will make a commitment. We have lost sight of the standards that God has. The richness in the pursuit of what God has for us. How about marriage? You go through a season when you don't feel cared for, you don't feel appreciated, you feel that you're being taken advantage of, that you're not being noticed. But there's someone at work who notices you. There's someone at the health club who thinks you're clever. There's someone online who wants to dialogue with you. And the temptation is for us to leave the one we have committed ourselves to through marriage and to move into somebody else who has offered us, frankly, so little. We are lured and enticed by our own desires. They keep spinning up and they spin up and they spin up. I'm going through my trial and I am lured and enticed by my own desire. I wanted to blame this man. And I had a list of things that I thought were accurate to blame. I could think of any number of ways it was his fault. And then the true ugliness of my heart is I began to think about revenge. And that's when it scared me. So desperately wanted the pain to stop. I so desperately wanted to be out of this that I began to think, what could I do back? I had convinced myself I had a right. Let's end with this last question. Is how we deal with trials really a life and death matter? Look at that question. Is how we deal with trials really a life and death matter? Come on, Jackson, it seems so dramatic. Yeah, yeah, look with me at verse 15. Then desire, when it is conceived and gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully fully grown, brings forth death. This is a warning, James is saying to these folks. It is a warning that if you have a pattern of allowing yourself to be enticed and lured, where your desires dominate, you see no victory, you are not pursuing, you are not engaging, you are not turning back, and you continue to live in a self-deceived world, what you're communicating is you have no faith. You are spiritually dead. There are some of us sitting right here in this room where this describes us, and even now we would say, no, 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 that's not true for me. We deceive ourselves. We continue to say, I have a right. What's wrong with me if I? I want, I need But, if you've been around Park very long, you know my favorite word in the Bible is but. But, because every time there's bad news, there's also good news. Bad news, but the gospel, the good news. And we have good news here. Look with me again at verse 12. 
Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him, those who stand strong, those who are steadfast, those who seek wisdom, those who know joy, those who are willing to pursue, not perfectly, but credibly. This idea of a crown, we're probably many of us thinking of a gold crown. Let me show you the kind of crown it's talking about. It can be translated as wreath. This is Nike, the goddess of victory. This particular picture is in the city of Ephesus. We know it as the book of Ephesians. And you see what's circled in red there is the wreath. It is what's given to the athlete who wins. And James says, for us, when we remain faithful, we spiritually win. When we remain faithful, we get this crown. We are never without hope. God always provides a way when we turn to him to seek him for wisdom. Let me remind you of 1 Corinthians says, Paul writes to the church in Corinth, which is in, in Greece. He says, no temptation is overtaking you that is uncommon to man. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. There is always hope when we are lured and when we are tempted and when we are enticed, when our desires spin up. For those that are followers of Christ, there is always a way to follow God in the midst of these things. Do you remember back years ago, years ago when they started putting GPSs in cars? I look around, some of you were not even born yet. Began to put these screens in the car, a little map. I remember the first time I was in a car like that, I was in D.C., and a friend of mine was picking me up from a conference, and he was convinced he knew his way out of D.C. We kept getting lost. He goes, well, let me try this new thing, and he punches in the number to where we're going. And so we go along. It's got the route outlined. Let me show you what it looks like. It's got this out, the, the route outlined, right? And so it says for in the, his particular one, it says go left. And so what he chooses to do is go right instead because he's convinced he knows better. And it was the first time I heard the, the woman, or it could be a man, an Australian, or whatever it could be, you know, that voice. And the voice comes on and goes, recalculating. It's another way of saying, where are you going? Where are you going? And so we turn and we get back on the track. And then once again, my friend is convinced. He says to me, man, I know my way out of D.C. And he takes another wrong turn. And once again, the map comes up and you hear the voice recalculating. Now, let me explain what happens spiritually when we finally come to a place where we recognize that our desires are winning. When we finally come a place where we are willing to submit and say to God, I need your wisdom. When we finally come to a place when we are willing to confess and to repent, repent meaning we turn from this and we turn to Jesus, what we hear the Spirit of God say to us is recalculating. Let me show you how to get from here to where you need to be. Back into the presence of God, back into following His wisdom. We make these wrong turns and the Spirit of God says, okay, whoa, whoa recalculate. How do you move from here to here? But we only experience through our confession, admitting with God that we have sought our own wisdom and through our repentance of turning from this and turning to him. God has not left us, left us without hope. He's given us himself and the person of the Holy Spirit to empower us and to convict us and to guide us and to prompt us. God comes and takes up residence in our lives. He wants us to obey. He wants us to know him, to know his wisdom. Let me just share these two quick verses with you. 1 John 4.4. 4. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. John 16, 8, and he, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit comes, he, the Spirit, will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. The great thing about the gospel for us is that the victory of the cross is not just the victory over the condemnation of sin, but also over the power of sin and the temptation of sin. During these 18 months, I walked a lot in this room. I'd come in here and I would wrestle and I would cry out and it finally hit me one day. One day as I'm walking in here, the Spirit of God finally graciously says to me, probably been speaking to me all along, I just couldn't hear it. Finally, James, 
James. And so I go and I read James and I cry out to God, I need your wisdom. I don't know how to deal with this. Man, it is eating my lunch. It is dominating the quiet moments of my life. God, this is hard. And the graciousness of God said, why are you allowing this person to define who you are? Because it is already defined by me. You are known and loved and pursued and received and forgiven. You have been adopted. You are my son. Now, I would love to say the next day the trial was over. I got it, Lord. Let me go journal this down. I'm good to go. But in the graciousness of God, he extends it out because he wants to make sure we truly understand, we truly get it. Will I turn to him? And when the bad report comes from someone about this guy and what he's saying, will I stop and say, okay, that does not define who I am. I am loved and pursued and received and forgiven. I have been adopted. I am a son of God. That's who I am. And that went on for months to where finally when I heard bad reports, it did not spin me anymore. Trials are hard. Trials are difficult. And that will be hard to pick up. (laughs) And for some of us, we need just a moment to pause and to be able to say, I'm in the midst of a trial, and I'm not handling this well. God, I need your wisdom. And so we want to give you that moment. Let me close with this story. It's a powerful story. We've shared it before because it's a story of a Chicagoan. A guy named Horatio Spafford. Lived here in the city, was a lawyer, taught law school, was a wealthy man, and he had built up his portfolio by having a lot of land along Michigan Avenue. And then October 10th, 1871, the great fire of Chicago came. And he lost everything. Financially, it was devastating for him and for his family. And for the next two years, he spent time trying to figure it out and dig out of this hole and to get righted. And at the end of the two years, he and his family, frankly, were exhausted by all that it took. And so he chose to take his family to London. He was going there to meet up with D.L. Moody. Yes, Moody of Moody School and Moody Church. And he takes his wife and his four daughters, and they go to New York, and they're about to board a ship, a French ship, to head to, to London. He gets word that there's an issue around one of his business deals, and they need him. And so he waits in New York, but he didn't want his family to wait. So he sent them, he put them on the boat, and he sent them across, his wife and his four daughters. Nine days later, he receives a telegram, and all it says is, saved alone. That somewhere out in the Atlantic, a British ship ran into the side of the French ship that his wife and children are on. And 226 people, including his four daughters, lost their lives. Can you imagine the pain? The frustration, the hurt that this man who's already experienced a lot in the last couple of years and now he experiences, I'm telling you, as a father to lose a child. He gets on the next boat he can. The captain knew that he had had family on the ship that had sunk. And so when they come to the place where the ship had sunk, the captain calls him up and he says, A careful reckoning has been made, and I believe we are now passing the exact spot where your wife's ship was wrecked. The water here is three miles deep. He goes back to his stateroom, and he sits down, and he pins this song, Peace Like a River. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, It is well. It is well with my soul. It took me a while to be able to say, it is well with my soul, God. It is well with my soul. And there's some of us in this room that we are going through it right now, and we can't say it yet. It is well with my soul. And may you take a moment right now where you would hear the Spirit say, recalculating, 
and you move from the place where you're seeking your own wisdom and reconnect with the wisdom of God.